JC Direct this week, MPC rate cuts coming later than we had hoped. Advertech results really strong, old mutual results really strong, but a bank and Soto Awards, South African listed trackers. This is JC Direct episode 580 for 28 March. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. Uh, so we've got two events kicking off in April. We've got the first on the 18th, which is at 5.30 in the evening. It will be at the Baker Street head office, Standard Bank, and Webcast. Getting started in shares, everything you needed to know, taxes, ETFs, how to build a portfolio, satellite and core, all the details around that. And then the following week, the Tuesday, the 23rd, 11 a.m., I'm going to be chatting with one invest around their offshore ETFs, particularly the ETF 5IT. This is the purest tech ETF on the JSC and has done by a long way the best performance. Just one lap.com slash events for booking and more information. So let's kick off with some of those results. And most important, I suppose, let's start with the old mutual ones. They were surprisingly strong. They really did come in with a, 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 a giant set of numbers. Now, why is that surprising is that, quite frankly, what we get with old mutual and everybody else in this industry, whether you're whatever sort of financial services, frankly, whatever industry, we're not getting GDP growth. 0.6% last year, population growth probably 2%. We were actually getting poorer, but what are we seeing in the old mutual results? Strong growth, which means they are stealing market share. Of course, the problem is someone out there, out there has lost that market share, and we'll see in time who that is. But I really was very surprised by those results. Uh, they're also doing a bank. Why a bank? I know why they're doing a bank. They love the idea around a bank. They think to themselves, you know, it's another way in a zero growth environment. How do you make money? Well, you make some money by doing a bank, getting into new sectors. But man, banking is crowded. And getting people to switch bank accounts is difficult. And I'm being polite there when I say difficult. So we've seen Discovery Bank, and they're actually ahead of their 1 million uh, target. They're targeting a million customers by, I think it was end of next year. They're probably going to get there by end of this year. We've seen Time Bank also doing very well and exceeding its initial targets. But Discovery Bank's obviously part of Discovery. Some people hate Discovery. Some people love it. The whole vitality, the insurance, they put little trackers in your car. How do you drive? They put a watch on your wrist. Are you going to gym often enough? All of those sort of complexities. They're doing incredibly well, but they've got that base already. Time Bank came at you because there were kiosks in the pick and pay. They were offering great, and they probably still are, interest rates on, I think it was the first 100000 that you deposited with them. What's old mutual story? I don't get what they're going to do to make their bank stand out. I don't get what they're going to do to make people rush off to banking at Old Mutual. I really don't. Uh, if we look at the share price, uh, closed on uh, Wednesday at 11.84, there's a bit of support around the 11.50 level, and then a bit of resistance from about 12.40 up to around 12.80. The chart is it's not looking strong at all. What you really want is a breakout of around that 13 rand level. That's what's really most important. But what we do see with this particular is that they are cheap. I mean, make no bones about that. I mean, their PE uh, 7.7, forward PE 7.1. We've got a dividend yield of over 7. Their price to book is below 1. The 20-year mean is 1.1. They should probably trade at a slight premium to price to book, which means potentially we got a 20% uplift here, which takes us to the top of that range. But if we look at the, the consensus, what is the market looking for? What is the analyst expectations and, and, and price targets? So there's two strong buys, two buys, and a hold. Uh, and that's, we don't usually see sells or strong sells at all. But what we've got here is a average price target of 1481, a low price target of 1350, an old mutual closed at 1184. Yowza. I mean, that's just a yowza. But you know, price targets are one thing. It's another whole thing to really get to those levels. I think the stock is cheap. I really do. I think the stock is cheap. I think it's looking okay. 
I'm not sure where it gets all of its upside from. And that bank is going to be expensive. It will launch at the end of this year. I remain deeply skeptical about banks. But talking around skeptical, let's have a touch on the MTN results. So the results were a horror. We we saw 72% down in terms of headline earnings per share. Now, some of that was tax issues and the like, but a big chunk of that was quite simply that they are got a problem in Nigeria. And that problem is the Naira. And that Naira problem is really quite simple. What's the story there? Well, we've seen massive devaluation in the Naira, and that is hurting MTN and the profits. Now, the devaluation is in the order of 80%. The problem is it's not coming back. We're not going to see the Naira suddenly strengthening markedly. We might see a bit of strengthening, sure. But are we going to see it going up all the way to where it was at the beginning of last year? No. So they lost six rand because of that uh, uh, earnings per share, because of that Naira devaluation. It's simply not coming back. MTN is simply just rebased to a lower level. Make absolutely no mistake about that. It has got that money gone. It, it's not coming home. It's not going to suddenly reappear. And the chart is looking quite positive. Three weeks ago, weekly chart, we got an engulfing candle the week before, a couple of weeks before, but had a bit of a kangaroo tail. It certainly is looking strong. And if we look at the uh, targets for MTN, there, there's some opportunity there. I mean, the, the consensus is actually not bad, although interestingly, we actually have some strong sells, three strong sells, five holds, and four buys. The low target is 80, the average is 110, and the high is 130. I think that 110 is maybe doable in the short term. Uh, certainly, they've got a decent dividend. Yield is 3.5%. That because they, can, they held their dividend, notwithstanding headline earnings per share collapsing. If we look at valuations, they're not expensive, but they shouldn't be expensive is very much my sense. This is not a stock that should be trading expensive. Its price to book is 1.2, whereas uh, standard deviation one down is one and a half, minus one standard deviation. So cheap in that regard. Its uh, PE is, well, forget the 42. There's some issues there, but forward PE about 14. The mean is around 23. Standard deviation one down is five. It's looking cheap. The chart looks good. But what's the story for telcos? So they've got 300 million subscribers, just under. That was up a couple of percentage points. Their data subscribers are about 150 uh, million, so half of them. But they're getting price compression happening in that space. So not a lot of excitement to, to really talk about there. And they've got their, their mobile money. There's only 75 million users. The problem with telcos, and I always said they need to be utilities, right? Water, power, data, utilities. They have the problem that they've got constant capex as we roll out 5G, 6G, 7, 8, 9, and 10Gs. You know, 5G is still relatively new. I only got it a year ago, but the 60s, 6G spec is already coming. It's already happening. And uh, yeah, it'll be a couple of years. Now, sure, they've off outsourced their towers. They've sold those to separate businesses. We saw uh, Telcom sell their SwiftNet business. But again, What's the compelling story here? There's still costs that are coming back. The mobile money, everyone wants to be an FSP. Heck, old mutuals launching banks, everyone wants to be an FSP. What's your edge being an FSP? The short answer is you don't massively have one. So if we look at the returns, and we've got a 10-year return, Vodacom's up 38% over 10 years. That is a KGAR of 3.3%. Okay, throw in a dividend, maybe it goes to 6.5%. Telcom's at 19% in total, KGAR of 1.8%. MTN is minus 31% over the last decade, uh, and Blue Label minus 40%. I just don't see the compelling story here for, 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 for these uh, uh, telcos. They, they, they're struggling. They, they're in a space where price pressure is just constantly coming against them. They're going to speak to the, the Nigerian regulator. They want to see if they can't get some price increases coming through. Fair enough, they can probably get that signed off. Is it going to completely uh, pay them back for what they've seen in terms of the, 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 the pain and suffering with the devaluation of the Naira? No. 
No. So it's a sector which, I mean, I, I held MTN for a long time. I sold it in 2015 with that $5 billion, uh, a tax bill that popped out of Nigeria. I've never looked back. We got out at around 175 rand or so. It had been a great trade. We'd bought it around 12 rand 50. But I don't see the massive upside in this sector going forward. I think it is a massively struggling one. And I thanks, but for me, no thanks whatsoever. But then on to some results that were really good, and that is Advertech. And I did a TikTok earlier in the week. What we see with Advertech is really strong uh, operational leverage, and that absolutely matters. And it's something which is, is usually given to gold miners and the like, right? And what is operational leverage? So you're mining gold. The gold price goes up 20%, but your cost base is largely unchanged. And that's huge. That's absolutely huge and a big deal for you. And you just basically take that to bottom line, increased profits. But you can see it in other businesses as well. Clicks used to be a great proponent of this, and now we're seeing it in Advertech. So the easiest way to spot this operational leverage is the fact that revenue is up 13%. HEPs is up a bigger number, 19%, and dividend per share is up a still bigger number, up 45%. But how do they get operational leverage? Well, they've got classrooms, and they add a student, and that student pays fees. I don't know, 50000 a year in fees. I don't know what school fees are. I don't have kids. Student pays that 50000 school fees. They go sit in the desk at the back of the class. What's the increased cost to the business? Nothing. Uh, maybe a little bit. They had to buy a desk. They had to buy a chair. But they've already got the classroom. They've already got the teacher. They've already got everything in place. There's no real cost. So what we've seen is a massive increase in operating margins. At the school level, in 2020, operating margins were 17.8%. Now it's 20.3%. In tertiary, operating margins was 23% back in 2000. Now 26.3%. And that is quite simply because they're improving the occupancies. And we can see it here nice and simple in terms of the school capacities, as they call it. So forget the enrollment numbers, although they're up to 39,300 students. That's existing building capacity in terms of students. It's at 84%. Now that is what matters. February this year was 83%. They're pushing, they're getting more out of their buildings. That is what's made uh, Advertech a really, really strong play. It is, however, no longer a massively cheap stock. It has gone up some 70-odd percent in the last year alone, but I think it's still got some upside. Now, it's not going to give us upside in the 70% by any stretch of imagination. Sitting on a dividend of 3%, a price earnings of 16 and a half. They can do 15% growth next year. That takes it down to about 15%. So certainly looking attractive in that regard, but not for another 70%. I think we can probably start to see some sort of more realistic 20% growth coming through uh, per year in the years ahead from Advertech. Still a good number, a great stock. I hold it. I've held it for a very long time. I'm a very happy shareholder in the Advertech space. And then I want to touch on MPC. We had the meeting uh, yesterday. It was a day early because of the long weekend coming up. Rates unchanged. No surprises there. But what has happened and what is perhaps important is that the governor was very hawkish. Now, I've spoken before. It's his job to be hawkish, right? It's his job. He's basically got two blunt instruments to try and get inflation down. One is interest rates. Two is language. Threaten us. Of course, our inflation is not demand driven. We have no demand in this economy whatsoever. Our inflation is, it's all price driven, it's imported. And of course, with the higher rates in the rest of the world, we've got to have higher rates. Otherwise, money flows out and our currency weakens markedly. So we haven't seen any change in that. But what he did say was, hmm, cuts maybe by mid year and less of them. It's same with the U.S. Remember, we had, the, the thinking was U.S. first cut was going to be March. There were going to be six. Well, now it's going to be mid-year and there's going to be three. Same with the MPC. Mid-year, probably first cut. Two, maybe we're going to get three cuts. And the risk, and the governor said this very clearly, the risk is to the upside. It is absolutely to the upside on inflation. He's only expecting it to get back to the mid of the range, the 4.5% number, by the end of next year. 
We've got oil prices moving higher. We had Wandeli Shaloba writing in Business Day this week around the, the, the dry conditions. We're going to have a maize crop 10% down in last year. We've got enough maize internally. We won't have to import, but that pushes up prices. Hello, food inflation. So we're going to see inflation be sticky. That oil price in the mid-80s, it's not the end of the world, but it pushes petrol higher. I've spoken about that before. And if anything, oil is looking like it breaks higher rather than suddenly breaking lower. If it's going to go anywhere, 95 more likely in the immediate than 75. Inflation is not over, and that decrease in interest rates is coming later and slower than we had all hoped and expected. That certainly, I think, is the stark reality here. And then uh, last night, Wednesday evening, I was at the SALTA Awards, the South African Listed Tracker Awards. Uh, it's it's a seventh year that we've had these. So actually, yeah, it was quite, it was quite wild. Narina Fissa hosts them, and I was chatting with her. And to think that it's been, I remember the first one, which of course was then seven years ago. Big winners, Satrix, no surprises. They're the longest, what, almost 24 years in the market at the end of this year. They recently bought Absa, so they are the biggest. Uh, Satrix walked away with 10 awards. Absa, F&B, one invest. USB, UBS all got three. 10X Investments got two. And Signia got one. All the details at justonelap.com, you'll find it there. But the people's choice is always the big one. So, you get to vote for the people's choice. All the other awards are tracking errors, performance. In other words, hard math. Snarina, no surprises there. People's choice, we get to vote. Uh, on the local people's choice, the winner for the seventh year in a row was the Satrix Top 40. And that's not a surprise. Second was One Invest Top 40. Third was Signia Itrix Top 40. Fourth was Satrix Swix Top 40. And fifth was the Satrix Divi Plus. But they brought in a new People's Choice Award for foreign ETS, local listed, but foreign uh, assets. Uh, and there, Satrix won with their MSCI World. Second was Satrix NASDAQ. Third, the One Invest S&P 500 in uh, Info Tech Feeder ETF. Fourth, Satrix S&P 500. And fifth, the Signia Itrix Fang AI Actively Managed ETF. As I said, all the award details are sitting on the website, justonelap.com. You can go and find them there. Uh, it, 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 it's always fun. And I think it's, you know, industry events. You know, it's, it's, is it a sense of everyone gets an award? Sure. But I think they're important. I think they bring together an industry. And I think they highlight an industry, which perhaps more than anything is important. And of course, these are no longer ETF awards. You notice they're called uh, listed trackers. So these are ETPs. It includes actively managed certificates. It includes actively managed ETFs. It includes ETNs and, of course, ETFs as well. So I'll park that there for today. Uh, remember, we've got two events. They are respectively 18 and 23 April. Booking at justonelap.com slash events. The one on the 18th at 5.30 is webcast, but also live at uh, Standard Bank Baker Street. I've been saying it for an age. Come along. Let's say how's it. Let's have a drink together. That will be huge fun. We have 5.30 start. We are done by 6.30. You can still be home for supper time. So no worries there. Uh, and then justonelap.com slash events for more and for booking the details. Uh, my name is Simon. We'll chat again next week. As always, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all. Bye.